Yogesh Tripathi from Ayuka to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Helen Mason. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, to introduce you to Dr. Helen Mason from University of Cambridge. Um, it's my privilege uh, to introduce her and because I've also been privileged to work with her for about six long years being in Cambridge. So it, will al it was always uh, fun. So um, since I came back here, Helen has always been coming here and not only to, to collaborate with us on science, but she has been uh, really interested in uh, public outreach. She has been going to various schools and all. Uh, various colleges, Ferguson College, ICER, and various uh, schools in and around Pune. Not only to Pune, we've also taken her to Kerala for various workshops, uh, not, on, uh, not only for um, graduate and undergraduate students, but also for uh, school children. So that has been a, a real uh, great experience. So Helen uh, actually did his did her PhD in, uh, at UCL uh, in London, and then since then she moved to Cambridge and remained there till today and going on uh, for a number of years. Um, Helen has been um, honored uh, by the British government, uh, OBE, which is um, equivalent to our Padma Sri here in India. Um, she has uh, uh, recently been given a uh, medal, uh, any mounder, any mounder, most of you probably have heard about uh, solar activity mounder minimum. So she was a um, great scientist working at Greenwich Observatory, uh, discovered the mounder minimum, and Royal Astronomical Society started um, giving medals to renowned scientists in solar astronomy, and Helen has been one of the receivers uh, of that medal in 2017. Because of her public outreach, um, she has done excellent science, but also has been really interested in public outreach, as I said earlier, uh, since long time. She started a project called Sun Trek, and there were like few, every day there will be a few thousand hits talking uh, from people uh, looking at what the sun was all about. Recently, she has been given uh, another fellowship, it's called um, STFC, Science and Technology Facility Council, uh, which is a UK funding agency like our uh, Department of Science and Technology, uh, Leadership Fellowship uh, Award, where she has to deal with sun, space, and art. So today, uh, in a uh, she's going to tell us more about reaching to the sun, and she will be talking about new uh, spacecrafts, which are going to look at the sun including mentioning the, the, the Indian one, possibly in a little bit. So, Helen. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is like my second home. I come here almost every year, I think, and uh, watch how you could grow in strength, both in research and in outreach and the things they're doing with this three-day festival uh, this week. It's a great honor to be here. And I'm very pleased that you have all come to, to listen to me this evening. I'm an expert on the sun. I've uh, studied um, the sun and worked on many, many solar space projects. I'm very old now. And I've worked on Skylab a long time ago, and Solar Maximum Mission, SOHO, Hinode. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the more recent ones and what our hopes are for the future. Uh, but in telling you about that, I'll build on what we've learned from, uh, in the, from the past uh, few decades, what we know and what we don't know. So this is um, an image of the sun in a mission um, from helium. And it's an, it's an image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is one of our uh, spacecraft that we use to look at the sun. But if you look on the side here, you can see a huge explosion taking place on the sun, a solar flare. Now, before I want to go into details, I want to thank uh, 
uh, members of my group. These are members of my research group in Cambridge University, uh, both past and present, and you might recognize a couple of people here. Here's uh, Dergesh Tripathi himself, who's a sous chef, spent many years, and here's Sargan Mali, um, who was uh, a graduate student with me and has just completed her graduate work and has returned to Ayuka as a postdoc. She worked with Dergesh and many other um, students now scattered around the world, over in the USA and elsewhere. So the most recent uh, solar observatory, which has been sent to the sun, um, is NASA's Parker Solar Probe. And this is what they call their mission to touch the sun, because it goes very, very close to the sun and samples the sun. It was launched on the 11th of October, sorry, 11th of August this year, 2018, very recently. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it later on in my talk. But here's the launch. It was launched on a very heavy uh, rocket, uh, one of the heaviest rockets that NASA has, not because it was very large, but because they needed to make it go very fast. So it was uh, launched on that rocket, and watching that launch was Eugene Parker, a very eminent solar scientist who this mission is named after. I think this is the first time that a solar mission has been actually named after somebody who is still alive. So you can imagine how uh, Parker felt when he watched the launch of that rocket to celebrate all the work he's done. Nikki Fox here is the chief scientist on the NASA solar probe. She's now moved on uh, to higher levels in NASA. She wanted to stay with it till it was launched. So let me just quickly summarize what we know about our sun uh, before I go into a little bit more detail about the space observations. The sun is our star. It's our source of energy. It's huge. So if we look at the size of the Earth, that is about the size of that sunspot. So sometimes it has these dark regions. At the moment, it doesn't have many. It might have a very tiny one uh, sunspot. But these uh, sunspots give us an indication of how active the sun is. So when there's many sunspots on the sun, the sun is very active. And we get a lot of solar explosions, a lot of solar flares, a lot of ejections of material. These sunspots represent positions where the magnetic field on the sun is very strong. It's a long way away. It takes light, just over eight minutes uh, to reach us from the sun. It's massive, and the temperature on the surface of the sun is around about 6,000 degrees. So as I said, if we compare the size of these sunspots with the size of Earth, if you can see Earth here, that's how big the Earth is. You can fit just over 100 Earths across the sun or a million Earths inside the sun. Jupiter is about 10 times the size of Earth, so a little bigger. So where are we? Our solar system is in the Milky Way galaxy, and Mumbai is somewhere around about here. We live in quite a quiet area, but there are billions of stars out there, some just like the sun, some younger than the sun, some older than the sun. And the sun is just really rather an average sort of star. Nothing special in the universe, but very special to us. And the reason why we are so interested in studying the sun is because we can see it very clearly, we can see a lot of motion, we can see a lot of things we need to explain, but also because we need to be able to explain our sun our star, in order to be able to explain all the other stars we see in the sky and all the other astrophysical objects we see in the sky. So it was born about four and a half billion years ago, and was born in, not in, this is an image from Hubble showing a similar region where stars are being born. This is the Eagle Nebulae, born in cold clouds of of, of, of gas. 
It'll last about another six billion years, and it will expand as a red giant and eventually envelop us, come out as far as the Earth. It will end, and rather spectacularly, by the outside atmosphere exploding off, leaving a white dwarf in the core. This is a similar star that has exploded, very beautiful, again, an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, and our sun will have a beautiful end. If it were larger, 10 times larger, it would end as a supernova explosion, a huge explosion in the sky with a black hole at the core. So the energy in the sun is produced in the core of the sun, as it is in the other stars. Helium is turning into hydrogen, and when helium turns to hydrogen, sorry, hydrogen is turning into helium, you get that the right way around. Hydrogen is turning into helium, and the helium is a little bit less massive than the hydrogen that forms it. And from Einstein's equation, the energy produced is equal to the mass times the speed of light times the speed of the light. And the speed of light is a very large number. So the core of the sun is around about 15 million degrees. And the surface, as I've said, is 6,000. And the energy propagates out through this, what we call the radiative core, radiative part, and the convection zone just beneath the surface. So beneath the surface, there's a lot of motion. It's like bubbling. It's like something on a cooker bubbling away just beneath the surface. These sunspots, as I said, when there are a lot of spots on the sun, the sun is very active, and we get explosions, we get material shooting towards the Earth, and when it hits the Earth's environment, it produces the beautiful northern or southern lights, the aurora. This is a beautiful manifestation of solar activity, but there are other less pleasant manifestations also, which we need to understand, which is called space weather, the way in which the sun affects the Earth. The sun spins on its axis. As you can see here, it's rotating rather fast, spinning rather fast, but it takes 25 days at the equator. Now, Galileo, very famous astronomer, did a lot of observations of the planets, of course, and got into trouble because of his confirmation that the planets went around the sun, that the Earth wasn't the center of everything, as they thought previously, confirming what Copernicus uh, proposed. Uh, and he was kept under house arrest. And this is a view from his house in Tuscany in Italy. Uh, but he also, and these are his actual drawings. Um, he actually also studied the sun. And here's when I said, tell you, do not ever look at the sun. The sun is far too bright, and it can damage your eyes. You can project an image of the sun, or you can use a very special solar telescope. He projected an image of the sun, and these are his drawings, made into an animation. And here you can see the sun is spinning. He associated these sunspots with the sun, which again was at that time not acceptable because all heavenly bodies were supposed to be perfect. And here he was proposing that the sun had spots. Now, there are some very famous um, Indian um, observatories. This is just two of them here. Holdai Canal in Tamil Nadu, founded 1899, has a solar telescope. And also um, in Udaipur, Udaipur in Rajasthan, founded a little later, uh, built on a lake to give us good seeing. Um, and I've had the privilege to actually visit Udaipur. And it has a very advanced solar telescope called the Multi-Application Solar Telescope. And here you can see an image of a sunspot taken with that very advanced telescope, which gives us information about the sun from the ground. If we look at the number of sunspots as a function of year, this is from the year 1900 up to the year 2000, you see that the average number of sunspots goes up and down in a cycle, which is about 11 years. So here there's no sunspots, and here there's a lot of sunspots. No sunspots, a lot of sunspots. No sunspots. 
So there's a cycle in these sunspots, and this tells us there's a cycle in the sun's activity. Sometimes the sun is very active, and we get a lot of flares and a lot of explosions, and sometimes it's very quiet and sleepy. At the moment, it's rather quiet and sleepy. It's in a phase when there's very few sunspots. Another very famous scientist, an astronomer, who actually uh, worked in Cambridge, where I am, uh, was Sir Isaac Newton. Of course, he's most famous for his work on gravity and Newton's laws of motion, but he was also very interested in the nature of light. And he did some experiments uh, with light, and he realized that what we call white light, this normal light, is made up of the colors of the rainbow, as you see in the sky when it's raining, through the, uh, reflected in the drops of rain. Um, he didn't get it quite right. Sometimes scientists don't get it quite right, but he realized that this visible light, this white light, was made up of these colors. He also um, built his own telescope, and he built a telescope using mirrors instead of lenses. Galileo's telescope had lenses, and Galileo was the first person to use a telescope to look at the sky. But we don't have to stay in the visible range. This is the visible range. This is the range our eyes can see and detect the colors our eyes can see. But we don't need to stay in that range. There is uh, radiation coming from the sun in many different wavelengths. Different. Here, we, if we go beyond the red, we get the infrared, radio, microwave, radio. If we go beyond the uh, violet, we get the ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays. So we can use instruments to study the sun in many different wavelengths, not just in the visible, which we can see from the ground, but in order to, uh, for example, look at the ultraviolet or the x-rays, we need to go into space. We need to get above the Earth's atmosphere to be able to uh, study it. I don't know how many people here have experienced a total eclipse of the sun. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah, a few of you maybe. Yeah, I think it was a little while since there was one in India. I uh, can't remember the last date, but it is an awesome experience. So the moon is not the same size as the sun, but the moon is closer to us than the sun. And it's just the right size to completely block out the disk of the sun. Now, the disk of the sun is very bright, so you mustn't look at it. And it's a million times brighter than this atmosphere, this crown of light, this corona that we see during a total eclipse of the sun. So we only see this when the moon blocks out the main disk of the sun. And you can see it's very beautiful. And to experience it is also very awesome and very eerie. The light, the, the sun goes out and it gets cool and it's very eerie. But here, you can see a lot of structure here. Now, this structure that you can see is determined by the sun's magnetic field. So what's happening is this gas in the corona is charged. We call that a plasma. It's charged. Somebody put the lights on for some reason? Sorry. Thank you. Um, and that's why it traces out the magnetic field. The charge goes along the magnetic field. Now, there's something also really interesting about this corona. The surface of the sun is 6,000. But this corona, this atmosphere of the sun, is over a million degrees. Now, I don't know whether that seems strange to any of you, because you would expect that as you move further away from the sun, it would get cooler, not hotter. It was very, very strange to the scientists. It took them a long time, more than 30 years, to realize that this corona was so hot. And because it's so hot, that we call it a plasma, a charged gas we call a plasma. It emits very strongly in the x-rays. So this is a picture of the sun taken with a camera which can detect the x-rays. We can't, but we can use a camera that detects it 
the X-ray emission from the sun, and this is a, uh, on a satellite called Yoko, which was a Japanese satellite, and here you can see this very hot plasma in the solar atmosphere from the corona. And you can see a lot of interesting structure here. You can see some very dark regions. Now those regions are where the magnetic field is open. And the solar corona has escaped along the magnetic fields because it's charged, it can go along the magnetic fields into space. These regions here are where the magnetic field is closed and that plasma is trapped. In fact, these regions here, which are very bright, are where the sunspots are. So the sunspots form the footprints of these loop structures. So this goes quite quickly, but if you compare an X-ray image of the sun here, looking at the X-ray telescope and the sunspots, we can see that they are in the same region. Of course, that's spinning a little faster than the sun spins. So we can visualize that in a way like this. We've got a loop of very hot million degree plasma, gas, hot ionized gas up in the corona. And we can think that perhaps these are the magnetic fields on a bar magnet, the magnetic field. It traces out that magnetic field. In fact, the magnetic field pops up through the surface and the sunspots are these regions where it has the roots of a tree, where in fact the magnetic field is very strong. Now the magnetic field on the sun is formed beneath the surface in the layer between the radiative zone and the convection zone in a layer called the tachocline. That's what scientists think. It's formed beneath the surface. Now what I didn't say, I said that the sun spins around about, takes 25 days at the equator, but it's a bit slower in the polar regions. It takes 30 days in the polar regions. So it's not spinning at the same rate in the polar regions as it is at the equator. Now the Earth couldn't do that, otherwise all of the countries would get stretched out around the Earth. But the sun is, a, is, a, is all gas, it's plasma, so it can do that. It's so hot, it's all gas. So it's spinning faster here, so the magnetic field gets wrapped around inside as it spins around faster at the equator than the poles. And eventually, it pops up from beneath the surface and forms these large loops of uh, hot plasma, coronal loops, with the sunspots at the foot points here and here. So if we look at the X-ray emission from what we call solar minimum, when there's no sunspots, to solar maximum, when there's a lot of sunspots, we see a big difference. Here there are hardly any sunspots. There's very little X-ray emission coming from the sun. Here there's a lot of sunspots, and there's a lot of X-ray emission. And that's true for the ultraviolet also. So now, if we ask, well, what's happening now? This is, again, there's an image from Yoko in the background, but here, this is the average number of sunspots as a function of year. This is from now from 19, um, 1985, 1985, up to now, up to 200, 2018. And we can see that the number of sunspots goes up, it peaks, it comes down to a minimum, hardly any, up, down, and here we are at a very quiet time in what we call the solar cycle, the solar active region cycle, which is represented by those number of sunspots. Now, we have been extremely lucky in the past uh, few decades, certainly in my lifetime working on solar physics. We've had some fantastic solar observatories which have been in space. I'm only going to really talk about the observatories in the last uh, 20 years. SOHO was launched over 20 years ago and is still operating, although some of the instruments, we have better instruments now. Um, we have hard X-ray instrument, RESI. We have Hinodi, which is a Japanese satellite again. Stereo, which looks in three dimensions at the sun. The Solar Dynamics Observatory, which I'm going to mention again, which is 
example, our eye on the sun, always looking at the sun, always monitoring it. Um, another instrument called IRIS, which is looking at the details of the sun. Parker Solar Probe launched this year, earlier this year. Solar Orbiter, 2020. And I should have put a DTIA on here, but I will talk about a DTIA later. A DTIA, Indian um, satellite, will also be launched in 2020. So, this is an image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Now, this is an image in the ultraviolet. We can't see the ultraviolet, but it's taken with a camera which can see the ultraviolet. We need to color it, otherwise we're not going to see it. So in this case, we've colored it blue, which is a particular band in the ultraviolet. So the sun isn't really blue, but this is what the sun looks like in that ultraviolet band. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So what are the important questions for us to answer? What do we know already? Well, two very fundamental questions. Why is the solar atmosphere so hot? Why is the solar corona, how is the solar corona heated? Now that's a problem we've been struggling with now for many decades. We think we have a few answers. We may not have completed the answers. And like all scientific theories, people have different ideas and they argue about them and they look at the evidence of the observations to decide which ideas preferred. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about one of the proposals for heating the solar corona. What is the origin? Now, where that magnetic field was open in the X-ray image, I said the material flowed into space, and it flows out into something we call the solar wind. So the solar wind flows off the sun. What is the origin of that solar wind? And how is it accelerated as it goes out into space? So SOHO is, was perhaps the most comprehensive observatory that we had. It had instruments that were used to study the inside of the sun, interior, the surface of the sun, and that atmosphere of the sun. And I'll talk just a little bit about some of the things, but not in great detail. It was in a very special position between the sun and the earth. So if the sun is over there, and I am the earth, Soho was one hundredth of the way between the earth and the sun. And it went around, it goes around, it's still operating, goes around the sun with the earth. So it sees the sun 24 hours a day, every day. Most satellites orbit the Earth, but some of the solar satellites have rather unusual orbits. A DTRL-1, the Indian satellite, will be placed at that same position. L-1 is the first Lagrange point, which is a hundredth of the way from the Earth towards the sun and will orbit around the sun. So it had instruments to study, as I said, the solar interior, solar atmosphere, and that solar wind. And here it is being launched. Now this is a movie taken in the ultraviolet. The sun is not green. The sun is actually white. It looks a little bit yellowish from the light that comes through our atmosphere. But if you go up into space on the International Space Station, for example, it is white. It looks um, yellow to us through the atmosphere, and it looks orange at, uh, in the sunrise and sunset. But it's certainly not green. Okay. So this is an image taken in the ultraviolet, which is showing you plasma and gas, which is a million degrees. Okay. And here you can see this is one of the instruments on SOHO which is observing in the ultraviolet. Here you can see these dark regions, particularly down here, where the magnetic field is open and the solar wind flows out into space. You can see these very bright regions where the sunspots, we call those active regions, where the sunspots are, which have explosions, solar flares happening there. 
With SOHO, we can also monitor the magnetic field on the surface of the sun, and also with other instruments, for example, with Hinode. And here, this shows the magnetic field, these regions here where the magnetic field is very strong or where the sunspots are. You can see them emerging, and the loops would go from one region to the other region. The Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, SOHO, as they say, was launched over 20 years ago. Solar Dynamics Observatory was launched in 2010. Uh, it's still operating. And the instruments, it has instruments that look at different layers in the atmosphere, but the one that I want to talk about is called this AIA, which looks at the solar corona, and it looks at it in several different ultraviolet wavelength bands. Now, if you choose different bands in the ultraviolet, you can choose them such that they're sensitive to different temperatures. So you're actually putting a filter in front, which is just giving you different temperatures, million degrees, less than a million degrees. I'll show you in a minute. This instrument takes images of the whole sun in different bands every 12 seconds. Huge amount of data. Has a very good, this is what we call the detail that we can see, the resolution. Has a very good resolution. We can see the sun in great detail. So here, we have images taken simultaneously of the sun in different wavelength bands. And they are going from, um, up through, I can't read them from here, but this is um, 50,000, 100,000, 600,000, a million, 2 million, 6 million, up to 10 million. So simultaneously, we can watch structures as they heat and as they cool through different bands. It enables us to study in detail the formation of solar flares, active regions, how they develop, how they heat, how they cool. If we take that magnetic field that's measured on the surface, it's very hard to measure the magnetic field up in the solar atmosphere. It's something we're really trying hard to find ways to do. Very hard to do it. But what we can do is use the equations to solve what we think the magnetic field looks like higher up. So you take what it looks like on the surface and then you solve the equation. So these are what we call extrapolations from the surface magnetic field. It shows you really how complicated the magnetic field on the sun is. There are some regions that are open, magnetic field is going out. There are some regions that are closed where that hot plasma is trapped. Here we can see, as the sun rotates towards us and we, comes into view, we can see one of these active regions. And you should be able to see some large loops uh, in that active region forming and developing as the um, region uh, rotates into view. Now, as I said, we're interested in what heats the corona, but we're also interested in the source of the solar wind, the ma that material that flows off the sun. Comets are very good at showing us the, mag the solar wind, the direction of the solar wind. This is hale -Bopp. And in 1957, Eugene Parker, who the Parker Solar Probe is named after, proposed that our solar corona is evaporates and escapes into space forming the solar wind. So his work is really important in the regard of the solar wind and the formation of that solar wind. So a comet has two tails. One is a dust tail, white trail, and one is an iron trail. It's ionized. And that shows us the solar wind, because the solar wind is also ionized, so it tracks in the same direction as the solar wind. Now, this is plot is a little bit complicated, so let me explain it to you. We had a satellite called Ulysses, which is sampling the solar wind. Now, it was launched in 1999. It had operated for quite a long time. And it had an orbit which went around the sun, 
but it went over the top of the poles and right around the sun. And it was able to measure the speed of the solar wind. Now, the speed is the distance between the here and here. So here, the speed is about 800 kilometers per second, whereas here, the speed is much slower. So these uh, indications here, it's what we call a radial plot, take it from the center here, that distance of that line out to there is the speed. You can see the, the speeds here on these axes. So here, this is what we call the fast solar wind. It's very fast, it's about 800, 7 to 800 kilometers per second. And that comes from those coronal holes in the polar regions. The big coronal holes where the magnetic field is open. And it's quite smooth, it, it doesn't vary very much, quite steady comes from the coronal holes. And we've done some work on that with SOHO. I myself have done some work identifying the exact source of that. Whereas here, where the active regions are, you can see this spiky bit here. This solar wind here is very variable. It's not as fast, and it's very variable. And the parameters vary a lot. The speed varies, but other parameters vary a lot as well. So this slow solar wind we think comes from around the active regions, but we're not quite sure exactly how it's formed. Now, when you get the solar wind flowing off the sun and it flows towards the Earth, it can impact on the Earth's magnetic field. If it's very variable, it can form shocks which can hit the Earth's magnetic field. So we really want to understand better this variable part of the solar wind. So here you can see I've illustrated this is a big coronal hole, this dark region here. The magnetic field is open and this vast solar wind is flowing out from that area. Quite steady, doesn't really disrupt the Earth because it's quite steady, the Earth knows it's coming. It's only when the Earth is impacted by a shock or a jolt that we have problems. Here are the loops where the uh, magnetic field is closed. So we think that there are different components to this solar wind that flows towards us. Coronal holes, there's a steady component here, fast. Where the active regions are, we think there's a slow component coming, coming around the outside in some way, we're not quite sure how. And then there are these explosions, sudden flares, and what we call coronal mass ejections, which I'll show you in a minute, which shoot out into space and shoot towards the Earth. So the solar wind itself is quite complicated. It has these different components that we need to try and understand. Here's an image of the sun. This is, I think, an um, eclipse here in the background. The sun's been superimposed, blue. Not, it's not really blue. It's an ultraviolet image. And we can see how far these streamers, we call them, above this inactive regions are here, here underneath, extend way out into space. Another space observatory that I've worked a lot on is called Hinodi. It's a joint Japanese, UK, NASA observatory. And I've in particular worked on a particular instrument in the ultraviolet, which is my expertise. And that instrument called ICE, the EUV spectrometer here, uh, the principal investigator, the lead scientist is Louise Harrer at University College London. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details because I don't really have enough time. But one thing I want to say about getting spectra, I don't know how many of you know what spectra are. Maybe some people who have studied astronomy know what spectra is. A particular line emitted by... Um, the, the gas, the corona in this case. But if, we, if the gas is moving, we get an effect called the Doppler effect. And some of you might have heard of the Doppler effect. It's like when a car is going around a racetrack, it goes meow like that, or a train coming towards you and then away from you. The frequency changes. So if plasma is moving away or towards us, we can measure a shift in the wavelength. 
So here, blue is coming towards us, and red is going away from us. So this gives us a very good way to measure the, the um, mo motion of the plasma. And here, this is an active region. These are the large loops seen by this instrument, ice. And what we saw around the edges here is this blue. So we've got the red loops here, which is plasma falling down. But here, we saw plasma coming towards us. And we think that this could be connected with the source of that slow solar wind. So we have some ideas. What we do in science is we build some models, work out the equations, we predict what we might see, and we compare that with what we actually see. And very often, we don't actually see what we're predicting, and we have to go back and do it all again and, and try and get it better. And with each new spacecraft, it becomes more and more difficult to actually explain the detail that we see. But as I said, one of the theories is there's a process taking place up here called reconnection, which is shooting material out into space up into the slow solar wind. I'll show you the process in just a minute. But we think that when magnetic fields get twisted up in some way, they don't like to be twisted up. They like to be smooth, like a loop. They like to be in that shape. If you get them twisted up, then they snap and they change. And when they snap, magnetic energy is released. And that magnetic energy changes into heat, and into motion, into kinetic energy. So Parker, Eugene Parker, who Parker Solar Probe is named after, had another theory. He said, if you take these loops, they're made up of lots of strands, like lots of wires. If you twist them up because of the motion of the foot points, there's convection beneath the surface twisting them up, so this is them stretched out, you twist up just one end, you'll get lots of twists in these. They don't like being twisted, they reach a certain twist, and then they snap and they release energy. Now this is called nano flares when it's done on a small scale. Not a big flare, it's a small scale, nano flares. And we think that this contributes to the heating in the corona. Channel, channels energy up from beneath the surface up into these large loops where it's released. We've done a lot of work on this and we've compared what's predicted with what's observed. And we think that this is a strong candidate for heating the solar coronal loops. It might not heat everywhere in the sun, but we think it's heating those loops. Dergish here has done a lot of work on this as well. This is the process of magnetic reconnection. You can see the magnetic fields come together. They snap, they change. We could have magnetic flux emerging from beneath the surface. It can disrupt the magnetic flux that's already there, and it'll snap and it'll change. And we think that this can happen in large explosions, like um, solar flares, or it can happen in smaller uh, explosions called nano flares. So let's think about these large explosions. A flare, a solar flare. We categorize flares from A, B, C, M, X. And X is the largest flare. And then we start 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We've seen some flares. Here's one from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. We've seen many flares. The Solar Maximum Mission with SOHO. And here's one from the Solar Dynamics. This has bled out the detector. It's so strong, it gets really bright. The temperature gets really high. The temperature goes up from 1 million to 10 million or more. It can shoot particles out into space. It's a huge explosion. Suddenly, a huge amount of energy is released. Particles are shot out into space, and temperature can go very high. This is the first observation of a solar flare from the ground, and it was made by Carrington and Hodgkin in 1859. Now, when this happened, it had an effect here on Earth. First of all, the aurora, which are normally in the northern parts, came way down to lower latitudes. And also, it blew a lot of radio transmitters out. So it had a big effect 
blowing out radio transmitters. Now, in those days, that was interesting, very interesting, but it didn't really matter. But now, we depend on technology. How many people here have got a mobile phone? Huh? Oh, not everybody. How many people haven't got a mobile phone? Huh? Just one. Okay. I bet you've got... How many people haven't got a TV at home? Huh? Okay. Oh, a couple here. But for everything, what about a GPS? Hmm? Yeah. Nowadays, internet. Who uses internet here? Huh. Okay. So everybody here uses technology, satellites, technology. We depend on it now. We've grown to depend on it. Okay? If a solar storm happens, if a big flare happens, it could affect that technology. Now, we think this was a really big flare, maybe X20, 21, 22, maybe much bigger. We couldn't measure it because the size is measured on the amount of X-ray radiation. And at that time, they didn't measure the X-ray radiation. Here's a flare happening with the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Be patient. This little box here shows different temperatures again here and here. You can see it starting now. Can you see it at all the different temperatures here? Right up to 10 million degrees. You can see it happening. And we want to try and understand that. We want to understand what triggers it, how hot it gets, and what happens afterwards. So here we can see one happening in the ultraviolet. And afterwards, we see these huge, beautiful loops growing. Here's the edge of the sun. That's in the ultraviolet. Now, in, in addition to a solar flare, which can get very hot, material can also shoot out. We call this a CME, coronal mass ejection, which is a bit of a mouthful. We call it a CME. This is the sun blocked out like in an eclipse. We have, a, we have a, an artificial disk blocking the sun, and here's the sun behind it. We do that because the sun is so bright, this is invisible. We wouldn't see this if we didn't do that. We block it out, and then we can see this fainter emission. Billions of tons of material moving with speeds of thousands of kilometers per second. And I'm going to show you here a movie. The sun is blocked out. There. Did you see that material shoot out? I'll run it maybe one more time, and you can probably see the comets. A couple of comets go around the back of the sun. There you can see material shooting out. Here's another example. Oh, what's happened there? This is Soho. The sun is here. And we've got this snowy effect. Hmm. I wonder what's happened there. The sun is there. Soho is here. Got all that snow. What's happened there is that that CME has hit Soho. It's hit the detectors on Soho and caused that snowy effect. Now, if it's hit Soho, it's going to hit us here on Earth. Okay? It's headed our way, what we call a halo CME. And we do care because it could affect us quite significantly. Here we can see another eruption. If you look carefully, you can see that one erupting out. We've superimposed the sun. It's, the sun's actually blocked out, but we've... Woo! That's a big one. See that going out into space. So, this isn't a scale. Here's the Earth, here's the sun. We get an eruption coming from the sun. But fortunately, we have a little blanket protecting us here on Earth, and that's our own magnetic field. This material that shoots out from the sun is highly magnetized, most times, if it's just coming steadily, wandering along, it'll just scoot around the edge here. It's not a problem. But if it's coming really fast or there's a shock, what it'll do is it'll hit this Earth's magnetic field here. Here's the Earth. And it'll snap it. And it'll change it and reconfigure it. The fields here will snap back, and particles will shoot down to those polar regions. And that's why you get the aurora in the polar regions. As I've said before, the aurora are beautiful. I've never seen them, but I believe they are beautiful. This is a picture of them taken from the International Space Station up in space. So this is the aurora seen from space. Here you 
interesting part of the space station. Besides being beautiful, they can also be harmful. They can harm astronauts if they're in space. They get a very big radiation dose. They can affect satellites. They can knock out um, some of the elements of the satellite and actually knock them out altogether in the sense of um, disabling them. They no longer operate. They're no longer working. They can cause electricity blackouts. They can induce currents. They can affect aircraft that fly over the polar region. So they can have lots of different effects. They can affect um, the, the level at which satellites orbit by affecting the Earth's atmosphere also. So one of the objectives of our research is to be able to think, can we, we call these solar storms, flares, coronal mass ejections that affect us, can we predict these? Can we understand when it's going to happen on the sun? When a region gets very complicated, when is it going to happen? Can the harmful effects be prevented? Yes, they can. If we know the storms are coming, what we can do is to put the satellites into a safe mode. What we can do for electricity is bring everybody into work, make sure we can divert it. But if we know one's coming, we don't have to fly over the polar regions. We could fly a bit lower. But all of those things are expensive. Now, these storms, they're not going to um, affect us in the sense of, of, of harming us personally or, or killing us, or they might, may harm if you're flying over the poles, but they harm us economically because they affect the technology on which we depend and they bring things to a halt. So we want to understand lots of things about the sun and about that solar wind. So I'm going to go back to Parker Solar Probe. Parker Solar Probe was launched in August, travels really, really fast. It, had its, it has, a, it has a, an instrument that images, but it doesn't image the sun. It images the solar wind that flows off the sun. That's working. It uses Venus in a very clever way to pull it towards the sun. So it, we call it a slingshot, but it's not speeding it up, as it might do if it were going out to other planets. It's actually slowing it up. It has to slow it up because the Earth itself is moving very fast. When the rocket is launched, it needs to slow it up to get it towards the sun. And it uses a Venus flyby several times. So it's already had its closest approach once. It didn't go as close as it's going to go because the more it flies by, the closer it will get. But it did get pretty close to the sun. Now, when it's close to the sun, the sun is a radio source, so we can't actually speak to the satellite. The best they can get from the satellite is some beeps. So they have some beeps, some beacons, which says, I'm OK, I'm not OK not feeling well, I'm really sick. Now, fortunately, the beacons that they've had, because it has gone around the sun, say, I'm OK, but you're going to have to wait to get the data back until the beginning of December, when I can send it all back to you. So in early December, it will be sending data back very soon. Now, it's going really, really fast. I said it needed a big rocket to get it going fast. And it's going so fast. Um, that actually, if it were here on Earth, it would take just over three minutes to go around the Earth. If it was going from here to Delhi, it would take less than one second. That's how fast it's going. So it has lots of different instruments. Some are sampling that solar wind, the magnetic field. Some are sampling the energetic particles. Some are uh, looking at electrons, protons, the makeup of the solar wind. And some, this one here, is just imaging to the side of the solar wind. In order to use it well, what we need to do is to combine the observations from this with the observations from the other satellites that I've talked about, Solar Dynamics Observatory, Hinode, etc., because they are looking at the sun. And then we can really tell what's happening on the sun and what flows into the solar wind. Now, that's a NASA project, but we're all collaborating together. ESA, the European Space Agency, is planning to send Solar Orbiter uh, up in 2020. And now, there's lots of technical challenges with flying so close to the sun, for Solar Probe and for Solar Orbiter. 
And one is that it obviously gets very hot. Okay? Now, um, it needs special materials, carbon carbon uh, materials have been developed to shield the instruments of the back there. So, a lot of technology has gone into the development of uh, these missions. Louise is the principal investigator on one of the instruments on um, Solar Orbiter. I'm not going to go into detail because I'm running out of time. But if you want to do a quick comparison of the Parker Solar Probe with Solar Orbiter, this one stays in the ecliptic plane. That's the plane of the planets going around the sun. That means it'll, it'll see the um, solar equatorial uh, wind that flows off. Solar Orbiter will go out of the ecliptic plane. It will go up towards the polar regions, not as high as the poles, but it will see higher. Parker Solar Probe will get very close. That's um, 0.046 of an AU, and AU is the distance between the Sun and the Earth. Very, very close to the Sun. Um, solar Orbiter will go close, but not that close. The instruments uh, on Solar Probe are looking at the magnetic electric fields, energetic particles, trying to detect shocks, waves in the solar wind, and taking images of the solar wind. Solar Orbiter will have similar instruments looking at the solar wind, but also it will have instruments looking at the sun itself, we call remote sensing. So before I finish, I just want to say a little bit about the group here at IUCA. As I said, I've worked with them for a long time now, both research and uh, doing outreach work. And they will launch, they, they are part of the Aditya One team. Now Aditya One is India's first mission to the sun. And that will be launched in 2020. It's a very exciting time for, us, for India. Um, in fact, they're building uh, one of the instruments that goes onto that solar mission. They're building an instrument um, called SUIT Solar UV Imaging Telescope, and this is led by Ayuka. And that will look not at the surface, but just above the surface of the sun, the, what we call the chromosphere. There are other instruments. There's a coronagraph instrument. There's a, an X-ray instrument. There are several other instruments on this um, satellite. And this will be a really important satellite. It, um, SOHO is getting very old, and it's much, very out of date. But it will be at that same position, or round about that same position, where SOHO is. So it will be looking at our sun. And here we can see uh, the instrument actually here in Ayuka. Now this is what we call the laboratory model. It's used for testing the, the lots of alignments, calibrations. But actually, the instrument has to be built in what we call a clean room. You can't get dust and bits of hair or things onto the instrument. It degrades it. So it has to be built in a special clean room. And one is being built in, in Bangalore um, to build both the suite instrument and also the coronagraph instrument. Um, so here is a, uh, an idea of the design. So I'd like to uh, end there. I think there's a very bright future for us. Very interesting times we're living in uh, with uh, trying to find that uh, source of the solar wind um, and to study the connection between the sun and the earth. Thank you very much. Yep. This is not on. Now it is on. So um, we have time for a few questions. Now the lights has come up. Who is going to be the first one? Over there. So what, what we think is happening is the, the core of the sun is 15 million. Okay, so the, the, it's hotter right inside. But energy is transferred up into the atmosphere, channeled by the magnetic fields. And then the convection beneath the surface 
to, it's moving those fields around, and that builds up energy, magnetic energy, which is then released. So we think that that's heating those big loops. There are other processes, like waves bringing energy up, which we're also investigating. They may play a role. So far, they haven't been able to bring up enough energy, but certainly people in um, Dergish's group are looking at waves as well to see how much energy they can, they can bring up into the uh, solar corona, but then it has to be released in some way. So you have to find a way to release that energy once it's transferred up from beneath the surface. So we think that we've made quite a bit of progress. The thing to remember is the magnetic field is very important. The magnetic field acts as a channel for the energy, both the nanoflare energy that we, that we think happens and also for these waves. It's channeling that energy up. Um, so, but we haven't got the final answer yet. And indeed, it might be that in different regions of the sun, for example, there may be different processes which are the most important. So one process might not be able to explain everything. We've focused on those big active region loops, and we think we've got pretty good agreement between what the theories predict and what we actually see with regard to heating and the cooling of those loops. In front here. That actually doesn't work, that mic. Is it on? Yeah, that's better. Could you compare uh, cosmic rays with uh, the coronal mass ejections? Could you compare, can I compare cosmic rays with coronal mass ejections? Well, um, coronal mass ejections are traveling slower, so that they would take about three days to reach the Earth. Cosmic rays coming from the sun uh, could be a fraction of the speed of light, so they will reach the Earth in, in hours, and they will be more energetic. But cosmic rays from the sun are not the only issue, because, of course, we have cosmic rays coming from space as well already. So, in fact, uh, in some ways, the solar wind can act as a blanket for the cosmic rays coming from space, which is a strange thing because it's magnetized. So it can actually dilute some of the cosmic rays. And one of the things that Parker Solar Probe wants to be able to do is to distinguish between the cosmic rays that come from space and those that come from the solar wind. And it can do this if it gets closer to the sun. So one of the objectives is to try and sort that out. You know, what is the contribution from space and what is the contribution coming from uh, events on the sun like solar flares. How would that uh, distinction be made, like this cosmic ray is coming from the sun? Well, I think it would be, perhaps you could do a t temporal uh, distinction. If you see us, if you, you know, you can correlate it with a solar flare happening, then you can determine that. Um, I think uh, it might be the energy distribution it has, things like that. But I'm not an expert in that field. But I think those are the sorts of parameters they might look at. Solar wind comprises of which material? Ah, okay, that's a good question. The solar com wind comprises of which material? Now, the sun is predominantly hydrogen and helium, okay? But it has trace elements of many other elements, oxygen, carbon, iron, all sorts of things. And the reason it has trace elements of those um, other elements is that there was a supernova explosion which happened before the formation of, the so of, of our sun and the solar system. So before our star, there was another star which went right through its life cycle, produced all those elements, and exploded. And that left the material from which our own star is formed. Now, the abundance of these trace elements is very important because different regions in the atmosphere and the, and the surface of the sun have different element abundances, which we're trying to explain. But once material comes out from the sun, that doesn't change. Whatever element abundance it had on the sun, it will have when it gets into the solar wind. Whereas other parameters, like the temperature or the density, might change, because you might get shock waves, you might get other waves. 
But that is a very important tracer for us, and the solar orbiter will be looking at the abundance of the source regions on the sun and what they're measuring in the solar wind. So those things that we put like tracers um, are very important for being able to determine uh, the abundance. They're very small amounts, but we can determine them and we can see spectral lines from them, so we can see them and measure them. But mainly hydrogen, helium, protons, electrons, alpha particles, hydrogen, helium. Um, so you were a shorter plot uh, of the sun, the sun spot versus time. Yeah. Uh, so it's Yeah, so d during the peak period, you get a lot of magnetic um, field erupting through the surface, so you get a lot of these sunspots forming, and you'll see the sun is covered in these active regions or, or sunspots. Um, the number of sunspots seems to vary a little bit. There are people that are studying this cycle of the formation of the magnetic field and then the way it dissipates, um, and it's, um, it's called the dynamo effect, so it's like a dynamo you used to have on the bicycle, you've got uh, motion and you've got ionized gas and it's formed. But it's quite complicated the way in which currents uh, inside the sun work. But yes, when that solar cycle, there's a lot of sunspots and, and uh, the, the variation in that is, is also has a, a longer period over it, so it's not always the same number of sunspots each maximum. And at the moment, it seems to be getting a little bit quiet, so we don't know how it's, if you notice the last curve was going down, so maybe we're not going to have very many sunspots, even when it goes up to the peak um, in, in five or six years' time. Maybe there won't be very many sunspots. Some people have, in the past, linked that to the climate, so when there's very little sunspots, called the Maunder Minimum, way back, they found that we had a mini ice age in the northern hemisphere. Um, so if anything, um, people look in great detail at the amount of radiation that comes from the sun in all wavelengths, and one um, criteria for that is the number of sunspots, it would seem that the sun is getting um, less active in that sense, and that actually we, we might be heading for a cooling period. Some people have predicted that. Uh, but the sun is deaf sun affects us here on Earth very dramatically. It can be linked to climate change in the past, but it is certainly not in any way at all explaining what is happening to the climate here on Earth now. In the last 30, 40 years, our, our temperature of our, uh, our Earth is rising, and that almost universally, uh, scientists believe, is man-made. It's nothing to do with the sun. There was a question here. What will happen when the sun will die? Well, um, uh, will it be a white dwarf or a neutron star? White dwarf. When the sun uh, ends, it will. It's predicted. Now, how do we know this? Uh, we have standard models for the life cycle of, of stars, and uh, we can. It's like if you go to a, a big. Uh, railway station or something, your shopping center, you'll see people of all ages. You'll see children, you'll see old people. So when we look at the stars in the sky, we see stars at different phases in their life cycle. And the sun is just in its middle age. But we can track, there's a super highway that most stars go along, and we can track, knowing the mass of the sun, where it's likely to end up. And it is likely to end up as a white dwarf. If it were much heavier, as I said, 10 times heavier, it would end up with a supernova explosion and a black hole in, in the core. Okay, there. Right, so if you, that depends for. for for the sun, it won't go that far, uh, but for one some star which is much more massive, as I said, could burn right up there, and then when it's burnt, it will 
implode and explode because it can't produce that, it can't hold, it doesn't have the, just the energy to hold the star together, it will explode at that stage. Uh, but that's why I said uh, before the sun, for our solar system, there had to have been a supernova explosion that took place in this region of, of our um, galaxy. At the back over there, last one. There's this theory called, if I remember it correctly, it's called coronasis. It says why the corona is so hot than the surface of the sun. It says something that uh, the IN26 is the 13 electrons are stripped from the orbit of the IN electrons. So does Can you speak a little Sorry, louder? I can't, I can't hear you. Can, you. Can you stand up and speak a little louder, please? There's a theory of which, uh, if I remember its name correctly, it's called coronasis. Uh, which says the corona is so hot because the 13 electrons from the ion atoms are in the corona are uh, stripped. Uh, does this theory hold true? So there's a theory that the corona is so hot because the ions no. are... So he's saying that um, because 13 electrons are stripped out of iron, so corona is hot. But what's the theory? Um, yeah, that's, that's how we, when we, I didn't explain, but when we look at those um, corona, when we look at the eclipse, can use a spectrometer, <coughs> and they, can, they saw a, a very strange line in the visible, the green line, which they couldn't explain with any other element, like helium's named after the sun, so helium's the sun. Then they realized that this line was due to iron, which had 13 electrons stripped off it. And they calculated how high the temperature needed to be to get... 13 electrons stripped off from 26, they found the temperature needed to be a million degrees. So that's why they realized the corona is so hot. But that isn't causing the corona to be hot. That's not heating the corona. That's evidence that the corona is really hot because you see uh, ions which have all of their electrons stripped off in that way. And indeed, when you have a solar flare, which goes to 10 million, you can strip even more electrons off the iron uh, going up to, you know, just leaving just a few electrons. And that's the area in which I'm a specialist because I actually specialize in atomic calculations and being able to um, use the observations to determine what the temperature and density and abundances are of those um, elements that we see. And we've developed a special uh, atomic database, or Chianti, which is universally used now by everyone to analyze that type of data, so that's my speciality. But it's not causing the heating, it's a result and, and, and evidence of, of the hot corona. In front of him. Hello. Um, you've mentioned that one of the objectives of studying the sun is to try to understand what's causing these eruptions on the surface and why the corona is getting heated. Continuously. So as of now, do we have any theory that explains this behavior? Yeah, um, well, I've explained a little bit what we think these nano flares might be heating, but let me talk about the eruptions. Um, what we think with the magnetic flux, magnetic field is formed, we believe it's really twisted up beneath the surface. So it doesn't come up just in straight wires. It comes up all twisted and tangled. So when it emerges through the surface, it has this this twist in it, and you can um, almost detect this from the observations, and we get a special feature where we see that uh, a structure is, is twisted, and um, if more flux comes up, it reaches a state when it just becomes unstable. It can't sustain itself anymore. The magnetic field changes a little bit, and it disrupts it and knocks it out of balance. So we have some uh, indications of why we might get these eruptions taking place, but again, it's something which uh, Degas Tripathi and his group is looking at, and other scientists are looking at, to understand better um, how this is happening, why this is happening. It's a very interesting area of research, and in fact, what's something that we're kind of working on this week, in fact, or trying to do some work on this week with regard to understanding that. We'll take two more questions. So let's see who was the first one. 
Um, maybe one over there. There, there. I need to have a torch, right? <laughs> uh, what will happen if the solar flares reach Earth and like uh, the magnetic field is not able to resist it? Okay, what would happen if the solar flares reach Earth and the magnetic field is not able to resist it? So, um, what could happen is some of the energetic particles of flare can penetrate. They could knock out components of satellites and this has happened in the past, so certain satellites no longer work, no longer operate. Now, if we know that this is ha going to happen, we can put the satellites into a safe mode. Um, astronauts on the International Space Station shouldn't be out doing spacewalks. They need to get uh, inside the space station. If we had human space travel, if we had astronauts on the moon, and between Apollo 16 and 17 there was a big flare, but fortunately, there was nobody on the moon. But they would get a very lethal dose of radiation if they were. So we have to have protection for any astronauts that are intending to go to the moon so that they can go inside or on Mars or anywhere else. But here on Earth, the effects, as I say, it could be um, to uh, damage satellites. They could be to um, affect the layers of the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere of where the satellites are orbiting, and if you change the layers, you change the density, you might change the orbit of a satellite. This might give us inaccurate GPS readings, for example. So a lot of um, uh, aircraft might land on GPS, but we need to be careful, and we need to calculate what's happening to those. So they're not, uh, it's, not like an, it's not like an earthquake or a hurricane in the sense that it's going to perhaps cause a lot of, of, of injury to people or lives, but it could, it, could knock, it could affect us economically. So it is number four on the risk register in the UK as a major incident because it could affect, if, I don't know, you, you occasionally have electricity blackouts, but if you had electricity blackouts for very large areas, um, then, and, and it took, when you blew a transformer, tra and that's happened in the past, transformers have been blown across the whole of Quebec was out of electricity, transformers blown. We don't have easy replacements. It takes a long time to get that electricity back. It's not just off for a minute or two. It could be off for days or weeks. And you can imagine what would happen if, if uh, you've got no electricity for days or weeks. Industry. And the other thing that happens is traffic lights don't work. People start out of traffic. You know, so th it brings chaos. So we want to be able to, to predict as accurately as we can so that people can take precautions. And people can the uh, electricity people, the satellite people, the other people can take precautions if they know. But those precautions, in general, are expensive. So they're reluctant to take them unless they have to. Okay, we'll take a question from the youngest person. The among youngest person? all the hands up. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the youngest? Mm. Yeah, Lagrangian point I mentioned, it's the point where the, the gravity pull of the Earth balances the gravity pull of the Sun, okay? So it's not a point where there's no gravity, it's just where the two balance each other. So it's a balancing point for the gravity pull of the Earth and the gravity pull of the Sun. Okay, there was a question there, yeah. Can we predict where sun sunspots will develop? No, that's an interesting question, very interesting well question. Can you predict where the sunspots will develop? Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not an expert in that particular area. Um, I think they can see some changes. Do you know anything more about that? You can maybe see some changes before they actually happen to the um, layers of the atmosphere. So you can sort of see some flux changes. Yeah? Maybe yeah, what, is a bit So longer. there are, when people look at the, the surface of the sun, there are different kind of waves they observe, like per moving perturbations. Looking at those waves, you would be able to predict how the waves are changing depending on the location. And the wave is changing, then there is some change in the property. And because of that, you can say something more about it. There might be some structures appearing or disappearing. It's a very interesting question. Mm. Very, very interesting question. That's why we go for younger very people, right? <laughs> Thank you all for your questions. Sonal, do you have anything uh, to say? Followed by this public talk, we are going to have a public sky watching. 
right in the backyard of the auditorium in the science park. So interested people can join us for the sky watching session. Thank you. Okay, with that, let's thank Helen again and thank you all for coming.